Barnaby Jones, starring Buddy Epson, also starring Lee Merriweather, with guest stars Meredith Baxter, Christopher Connolly, Mark Miller, Richard Evans, Richard O'Brien, special guest star Ida Lupino. Tonight's episode, The Deadly Jinx. to stand still, this is a place. Would you care for some tea? No, thank you. I haven't been in this room for 10 years, and I would say that not one thing has been moved. Well, I didn't think it was within my province to change anything. Jenny must have been 14. You took on quite a job when you stayed on to raise her when her mother and father died. Well, the Sutherlands were very wealthy, Mr. Jones. They left me well provided for. <sighs> Even if I have to say so myself, I was the only real mother Jenny ever had. Or with her parents running all over the world. But I didn't know them that well. I just worked on that one case for Mr. Sutherland. <laughs> well, they were very cold people, Mr. Jones. 
Showing love for Jenny just wasn't in their nature. And they were so strict with her. Still kids are like puppy dogs. They seem to love you regardless. I suppose so. But it seems that everything that child ever cared for was taken away from her. First her parents, that terrible avalanche in the Alps. And now this young man who was killed in the boating accident, was Jenny in love with him? Yes, Greg Larkin. He was a nice boy, what I saw of him. What bothers you about the accident, Ms. Revere? Because it's happened again and again. What has happened? Well, it seems that any man who becomes interested in Jenny meets with some sort of accident. How many have there been? Five years ago, Doug Wingate, the local football hero, thrown from a horse, crippled for life. Was he in love with Jenny? Oh, yes. And then three years ago, she was dating a boy, John Ferris, who accidentally drove his car off a cliff going home from here. Now, poor Greg Larkin. Reading between the lines of that worried look of yours, it seems to me that you think that these accidents were not all that accidental. Mr. Jones, I'm sick with worry. I don't know what to think. I mean, what if someone... What if someone wanted Jenny for himself so badly, he eliminated the competition? Yes. You see, I've got to be sure. If some mad fool is about, who knows where he'll stop? I'm only concerned about you, Jenny, that's all. Stan, you've been concerned about me ever since you almost had to flunk me in History One. And then I had to call you Mr. Porter. <clears throat> I would hope, now that we are colleagues, that you would consider my feelings about you more genuine. I do, Stan. <clears throat> well, then listen to me, for your own good. Go away for a few weeks. Take a sabbatical. No, I can't. Working's the only thing that's holding me together right now. Excuse me. Taking your hair out of pigtails doesn't fool me a bit, young lady. You are Jenny Sutherland. No, wait a minute. Don't tell me. You're, uh... Time's up. Barnaby June. Oh, of course! Your wavy gray hair. I remember I always wished my father had wavy gray hair. I'll tell you, when all that a pretty young girl can remember about you is that you got wavy gray hair, you better hang up the gloves. Mr. Jones, Stan Porter. Uh, How do you do? Are you a teacher, Mr. Jones? No, I'm uh, more of a learner. Mr. Jones is a private investigator. Oh. I'll uh, call you later tonight, Jenny, just to see how you are. Stan. Hey, Mr. Jones. What brings you to Santa Carla? Business or pleasure? Business, but it'll be a pleasure if it turns out to be a false alarm. Mrs. Revere sent for me. Cassie? Oh, she shouldn't have done that. I mean, she... She's didn't... worried about you, Jenny. <sighs> Great. The harder I try to blend into the scenery, the more I become a tourist attraction. Yeah, I suppose it is hard for the prettiest and richest girl in a town this size to be just one of the trees. Mm. Mrs. Revere probably figured that I could find out something about the most recent accident that happened to one of your young friends. Yeah, well, I know what she thinks. She thinks some big ogre is following me around trying to cast a deadly spell and whoever shows an interest in me. Ogres are my business, all sizes. Hey, you, that's my car! He's too young to shave, old enough to spell. Maybe before I make any more big deductions like that, you and I ought to find a quiet place and have a little talk. Milk for the young man, and uh, your usual, right? Thank you. Thank you. What's the usual? Maybe I should have had that. Only if you promise not to laugh. No secrets. That's our deal. A scoop of vanilla ice cream drowned in hot chocolate. Nothing very usual about that.
Denny. On the way over here, you said that you never saw Doug Wingate again after the horseback riding accident. No, only in the nightmare now and then. I remember climbing down the mountain to where he'd fallen. I thought he was dead. And his eyes opened. It was scary. I don't think I've ever gotten that completely out of my mind. Ms. Revere said that uh, the second young man, what was his name? John Ferris. He was a, a senior up at State. I was in my junior year up at uh, Pacific Western. You went away for a while to a clinic for a rest? Yeah, that was Cassie's idea. All I could do was cry all the time. I didn't make any sound at all. I needed the rest. So now I've got something to keep myself occupied. You like teaching? Yeah, very much. Uh, I, I don't think I can tell you very much about Greg's accident in the boat. It's still very vivid to me. Uh, it's sort of unbelievable. Uh, this doesn't seem to be exactly the place to blend into the scenery. Want to go? You say you haven't seen Doug Wingate since the accident. Didn't he ever write to you and tell you how he's getting along? No. I wrote to him in Boston once, though, at the hospital. He never answered. I heard that he could never walk again. Well, you go ahead. You must have a lot of paper to correct, teacher. I'll try to correct a lot of mistaken impressions around here. Thank you. speed and bluey. Any idea how this may have happened, Sheriff? Just sort of an educated speculation. Apparently something went wrong with the carburetor. It ran all right at normal speed, but when young Larkin opened it up, a jet stuck. It overflowed gas, caught fire on the hot engine. That boat became one fast-moving Molotov cocktail. Good theory. Where'd you get it? Lester Watkins. He runs a garage down the road toward town. Greg Larkin always worked on his boat down there, mainly because Lester has all the tools and <laughs> did all the work. There's a sample of his work. I get my plugs changed elsewhere. Lester knows what he's doing all right. He said he told Greg Larkin to get that carburetor replaced. You're welcome to take a look at the reports, Mr. Jones. Of course, I don't know exactly uh, what you're looking for. You know anything about Jinx's share? <laughs> I heard that talk, too. Pay no attention to it. And you think all of these accidents that have been happening around Jenny Sutherland are just a uh, coincidence in your book? Well, not one scrap of evidence says any different. And Doug Wingate's uh, horseback riding accident? That wasn't a police matter? <laughs> Who am I going to question? The horse? What about the young man that drove his car over the cliff? Look, Mr. Jones, I don't want to talk ill about the dead, but when young Mr. Clean-Cut John Ferris drove his car off a deep canyon road, well, we found a broken quart liquor bottle in the wreckage. Ms. Revere said John Ferris didn't drink much. You shouldn't have bought it by the quart. Look, I feel bad about Jenny Sutherland, too. I've known her since she could hardly reach the pedals of her bike. Well, when you got looks and money, people are going to talk about you, no matter what. You don't suppose Jenny's good looks and fat bank account might have been a fatal attraction for somebody over the years? 
You got any big city ideas? We got us a killer stalking the streets of little old Santa Carla, Mr. Jones. I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. Granted, our Jenny's going to be a very rich lady someday. What do you mean by someday? Well, you'll have to talk to their family lawyer about that. Gee, that used to be uh, Cal Medford. Still is. Well, thank you very much for your time, Sheriff. I appreciate it. OK, Jenny, cut it. Better let me give it a once over, smooth it out. I want to check your brakes, too. You got a squeal there. I didn't hear anything, Lester. That's because you got pretty ears. You don't hear what I hear. Well, maybe I'll bring it in later in the week. I really want to go home now. Well, I'll drive you. you give me a chance to road test it. I'll bring it back to you tonight. OK, if you really think it needs it. Well, Buck, I'm going to drive her home and bring the car back. OK, Lester, but I got to be out of here by 5. I won't be going long. It's really nice of you, Lester, going to all this trouble. I'd do anything for you, Jenny. Besides, we don't want to have happen to your car what happened to Greg Larkin's boat, do we? There she is, 10 miles. Oh, that is great for the circulation and the breath. Yeah, but it seems to me you don't get to see much of the scenery on one of those things. This is all the scenery I'm interested in, Mr. Jones. I've come from a 37 to a 34. Yeah, but the years and good food giveth, the bicycle take it away. Age is a state of mind, Mr. Jones. Yeah. Well. This is the state of California, and I uh, guess I just naturally assumed that Jenny would get her full inheritance at the age of 21. No, 30. Those were the terms of her parents' will. Of course, uh, Jenny wants for nothing right now. But in six years, as you put it, she'll be a very wealthy woman. Yeah, a very pretty one. How much would you say that her fortune would amount to in right round numbers? Her real wealth and property and securities today is appraised at three million two. Ms. Revere seems to feel that that amount of money wrapped up around a pretty package like Jenny might have a fatal attraction for someone. Cassie Revere is an old fool. She still treats Jenny like she's a teenager. Actually, Jenny is a very mature woman. She's certainly too mature for those young Galaheads who are always hanging around her. No experience, no judgment. And uh, sort of reckless, too. What do you mean? 
Well, it hasn't been exactly healthy the last few years for any young fellow who is fond of Jenny. Oh, nonsense. Just some overage show offs with the victims of their own damn foolishness, that's all. I take it you don't believe in jinxes either? Absolutely not. And Cassie Revere's just making everything worse. I've got to tell you, Mr. Jones, I don't approve of this raking over of old coals just to appease the devious suspicions of this old maid. I suppose what Jenny needs is a mature kind of man that she can lean on, someone with experience and judgment that she can depend on the rest of her life. Exactly. You wouldn't be sort of uh, staying in shape for that job, would you, Mr. Metric? I am not at all ashamed of my affection for Jenny, Mr. Jones. And it's not at all uncommon for a young woman of her circumstances to find exactly what she needs in an older man. Hello. I was uh, just in the neighborhood. Thought I'd return these books and see if Jenny would like to go out for dinner. Uh, well, I'll take them, Mr. Porter. Our dinner's already in the oven, thank you. Uh, perhaps she'd like to take a walk later. I mean, I just think it would be therapeutic for Jenny to be with friends at a time like this. Well, at a time like this, Mr. Porter, I think I'm quite capable of providing any after-school friendship Jenny may need. Thank you for returning the books. I'll tell her you were here. Mr. Porter from the school. Well, why didn't you invite him in? Oh, I can never tell what he's thinking behind those thick lenses of his. Well, Cassie, you should have invited him in. Listen, Jenny, dear, you mustn't encourage someone like that. Not even in the slightest. Encourage? Yes, he's, he's just not right for you. He, he's just a school teacher. Well, so am I. But you're also a very wealthy girl, remember that. And you should be very cautious about people who pretend affection for you. Darling, you look tired. Try and get some rest while I get dinner, hmm? Say Lester was dead when you got here. What time was that, Mr. Jones? About a half hour ago. And no one else in the vicinity at all? Not a soul. What time did you leave, Buck? Five on the dot. Lester was still working on Jenny's car when I left. I don't need three guesses, but to tell me what you're thinking of, Mr. Jones. I think we can scratch coincidence as an explanation of what's been going on here, Sheriff. Bananas and grapes come in bunches, but not coincidences. Buck, did you ever have any trouble with this jack? No, never. No problem. Four young men who all kind of like Jenny Sutherland, now they're all either dead or missing. Lester? He may have worked on her car, but no way. Lester blushed at hardware store calendars. Come here a minute.
I don't know how Lester felt about hardware store calendars, but I got a hunch how he felt about Jenny. Well, I'll be. Sheriff, somebody's trying to raise you on your car radio. Look, do you have any equipment in here that would make a track like that? No, I'll tell you, that could be a bike, though. You know, the kids bring them in sometimes. I don't think so. It's too regular, and it kind of goes along in pairs. Hey. hey, that must be the guy. Sure, the guy in a wheelchair. Somebody come in here in a wheelchair? Came in this afternoon. He asked for gas. He wanted to know, you know, where the cold drinks were. I said, come inside. I tell you, that guy moved that thing in and out of the car like it was nothing. Did you ever know Doug Wingate? Wingate? No, but I only lived around here about a year now. Mind if I use your phone? Sure, go ahead. There's one over there on the bench. Thank you. Operator, I want to make a collect call to Los Angeles. Barnaby Jones' office, may I help you? I have a collect call from Mr. Barnaby Jones in Santa Carla. Will you accept charges? Yes, Operator, I'd be more than happy to accept the charges. Hello, Betty. I want you to do some long-distance checking for me. Sure enough. Just name the direction. East. You can start with the Boston Memorial Hospital. About five years ago, they treated a Douglas Wingate for injuries received in a horseback riding accident. Right on. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely impossible. Douglas Wingate hasn't been seen or heard from in years. I'd like to talk to Jenny. Well, I'd rather you didn't, Mr. Jones, not tonight. Lester Watkins is dead. I'd rather Jenny found out about it from a friend. I'm afraid it's too late for that. The kind friend has already called from the village. Couldn't wait to offer a few comforting words to Jenny. How did she take it? She's beside herself, poor darling. Had to call the doctor to give her some sedative pills to quiet her down. She's sleeping now. Mrs. Revere, are you absolutely certain that you didn't hear someone in town mention that they might have seen Doug Wingate? I wouldn't be likely to forget. Why? Because I have a very strong feeling that Mr. Douglas Wingate may not be too far away from here right now. I think that it'd be a good idea to let Jenny rest for a few days. I've already called the school. Just let her sleep till the pills wear off. Good night. Good night, Mr. Jones. since breakfast. Well, I guess I was trying to reach you during breakfast. It was just an hour's drive, and I, I figured I'd better get the information to you before you went gallivanting off someplace. You got the right number from back east? I traced Douglas Wingate through four states. It seems that he uh, had a series of operations at that Boston hospital. None of which turned out to be successful, I understand. Right. He was released to a rehabilitation center just outside of Boston. Now, their records show that he entered college in Pennsylvania. I thought that was a dead end until I reached the uh, alumni director, who was working late. Douglas Wingate's class bulletin was mailed to upstate New York up until three years ago. That's only three states. You just love doing this to me, don't you? For the past three years, Doug Wingate has been getting his mail at Five Oaks, not 20 miles from right here. Congratulations, Mrs. Jones. You have just won yourself a trip to Five Oaks, California. Get in. I 
nice drawing. Doug Wingate, isn't it? That's right. If you are Doug Wingate, you mind telling me why you've been keeping it a secret that you've been back in these parts all this time? Do you have any business asking? I'm Barnaby Jones. This is my daughter-in-law, Betty Jones. I'm a private investigator working for, uh, you might say, Jenny Sutherland. Betty's been up all night tracking you back and forth across the country. What for? Before I answer that, do you mind telling me where you were about 6.30 last night? What is this? You don't have any right coming here asking me questions like that. I'll take it easy, Doug. We're only here because that wheelchair of yours made some pretty clear tracks all over the scene of a murder. Murder? Lester Watkins, you were there earlier. Buck Fowler will identify you. Maybe I was, but I was back here about five. Did anyone see you? Yeah, a dozen people. I didn't close up here until eight o'clock last night. What's this got to do with Jenny? I'll trade you an apology for an explanation. Why are you hiding here in Five Oaks? Who says I'm hiding? I just got a feeling. Is it so you can drive over to Santa Carla every once in a while and take a look at Jenny? Yeah. So I can get a look at her. That's all. Don't you think she'd like to see you too, Doc? No. Jenny used to look up to me. I don't think I could stand it to sit here and have her look down at me. It's enough that, that I still love her, but I don't want to spoil it. You're the only one I know who's fallen in love with Jenny and lived to talk about it. I know what people are saying, but she's not a jinx. You just had a lot of bad luck. Yeah, like that time you fell off the horse. How'd that happen? It was easy for anything but a nag. Jenny's horse took the jump like a rabbit. Mine balked and threw me. How'd you happen to pick a spooky horse like that? I didn't. Who did? Jenny. But she didn't know what she was doing. She feels bad enough. It wasn't her fault. She was just a kid. Thank you. I want you to talk to Mrs. Revere. About what? There's a doctor that treated Jenny for a while after John Ferris drove his car off that cliff. Get the doctor's name. I want to know the nature and length of her treatment and a diagnosis. I'm very sorry, but I cannot help you. Well, are you sure? Barbie thought that it, it might be useful if we could talk to the doctor who treated Jenny. I don't see why. I mean, what does it matter? And the clinic isn't there anymore. They tore it down for a new housing project. Well, did you ever speak to the doctor while Jenny was a patient there? Yes, but he didn't think it was anything serious. You see, Jenny's a, a very high-strung, emotional girl, and she had some dreadful nightmares. It's been a very bad time for her. Well, try to remember, please, if you can. Well, he said something about Jenny daydreaming too much, trying to escape reality, and having personality problems. Well, heavens, after what she went through, who wouldn't? Was the term split personality ever used? Yes, I... I believe it was. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Revere. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Sorry, did I startle you? Uh, no. Jenny Sutherland. I'm Betty Jones, uh, Mr. Jones's daughter-in-law, uh, secretary. 
I think you're mean. Why? Being here all this time, never even a call. How'd you find me? I, I heard someone say that you were living close by. So your old friend, Jimmy Winter is in San Francisco, and I thought that if anybody knew where you were, that he would. I didn't want you to know. I was afraid you might still be mad at me. I could never be mad at you. I love you, Jenny. I don't have a right to say that anymore. would stand on his head just to be around Jenny, but I think the closest he ever got to her was when he worked on a car. Buck, do you recall exactly what happened the day before Greg Larkin was killed in his boat? Yeah, like I said, uh, Greg trailered it in here for Lester to work on. For Jenny with him? Mm-hmm. They were driving over for Jenny to meet Greg's aunt. I'd say it was getting to be meet the family time for those two. And they left the boat here that night to be fixed. Mm-hmm. I tell you, though, Lester wasn't any too hot on the idea. He was busy. He told him all Greg had to do was adjust that spring on that valve. The kid could do it. But, I don't know, Greg said he'd rather Lester did it. I think he was afraid if he, if he did it wrong, it might cause an explosion. What time did Lester go home that night? I don't know. It was sometime after supper, though. What makes you think it was after supper? Well, when I emptied the trash around here, the next day I found paper plates. No cartons, you know? Is that plates plural? Yeah. Must have, must have had company. There was two of everything. There was plates, slaw dishes, drink cartons. Where would Lester get to take a meal like that? The diner, up the road here. Let's concentrate on that half. Two weeks ago, the night before Greg Larkin was killed out on the lake, Lester Watkins came in here and he ordered food to go. Poor Lester. Maybe you can do a favor for poor Lester. Try to remember, he ordered two of everything. Well, he didn't order two of everything. <laughs> you know, I never took an order like that before. What does like that mean? 
Well, besides all the other food, he orders himself a malt, like he always does. And then he ordered, would you believe it, he ordered a, a cup of hot chocolate with vanilla ice cream? You got a phone around here I can use? Yeah, sure, outside. Thanks. Hello. Hello, Betty. Can you reach that doctor? No, but I think Mrs. Revere may have the answer for us. She said that uh, the doctor told her Jenny was running away from reality, that she had personality problems. I was afraid of that. Did the doctor call it split personality? Yes. She remembered when I said it. Thank you, Betty. Hey, Mr. Jones! Asking about Doug Wingate? Yeah. Just came over the radio. The police say somebody stabbed him in a store up in Five Oaks. They say who did it? They don't know. But can you imagine that a guy in a wheelchair? Was he the same guy that came into the garage? One and the same. You still alive? Just barely, I guess. I only caught part of it, then I came looking for you. Thanks, I appreciate it. Forgotten all about me. Now, how could I ever do that? Ms. Revere home? I guess she went out of the store. That's all right. I, I really wanted to see you, Jenny. Well, how nice. Uh, can I get you something to drink? No, thank you. Jenny, I think I may have stumbled onto the answer to all those unpleasant things that have been happening to you. Stumbled? Well, that's hardly a descriptive word for expert detective work now, is it? Accurate, though. You see, I stumbled onto this thought that Doug Wingate is back and living around here somewhere. Doug? Very nice young fellow. <gasps> yes, yes, he was. Uh, I, I told you, he, he fell off his horse. Yeah, I remember. I told you. I talked to him. He said that you picked out that horse for him. No. Well, I don't remember. It was such a long time ago. Did you know that the horse shied? Are you sure you wouldn't like a drink? Oh, no, that's right. You're milk, aren't you? That's right. John Ferris wasn't much of a drinker either, was he? One for the road. Go on, finish it. Are you afraid? How much whiskey did you have to get down John Ferris that night? Enough to get him drunk so that he had the accident on the way home? Doug is living around here somewhere. I have the feeling. I've, I've just got the feeling. Would you like to talk about Greg Larkin's boat? 
Have you seen it? It's a beauty, isn't it? Maybe I should be saying all these things to the other Jenny Sutherland. What other Jenny Sutherland? The one who has never shown any love. Her parents were very strict with that Jenny. Well, it was evil, Mama said. Men were such beasts. Even my daddy. I had to keep myself pure. I couldn't let anyone touch me. You were taught that love was evil? What? I think you heard me, Jenny. One side of you wanting love so very, very much, the love that was never given you. The other side, afraid of being loved, afraid of being evil. That's the Jenny Sutherland that had to destroy anyone who loved you. I don't know any Jenny Sutherland like that. You didn't go to Greg's aunt that day, did you? You went back to Lester's because there was one little spring that had to be fixed. And then Greg's boat would only have one last fast run. I, I don't know. Lester was delighted to see you again. He offered to get you some food. I don't know. What are you going to have, Lester? The waitress down at the diner remembered a scoop of vanilla ice cream and hot chocolate. Lester didn't know what went on at the garage while he was at the diner. But he told you he loved you, didn't he? Only one person was ever afraid, really afraid, that you would be loved. And that one person was you. Get through to the hospital, Betty. Yes. Doug Wingate's going to be all right. But I wonder if she is. They'll never be able to prove it, Mr. Jones. Any of it. You only have to prove things against criminals. I can't believe that Jenny, who just waved goodbye to us, is a criminal. Maybe one day, with a proper treatment, she'll tell the doctors all about it. I, I did the best I could for her all these years, Mr. Jones. I know you did. But sometimes I wonder why there's so much room for love and little houses sometimes. And no room for it all in big houses. 